Hallelujah. Mount Zion Nation. Come on. Wherever you are, come on and praise him. Are you ready to give God a great praise? If you are, you can. Come on, put your hands on the beat like this. Come on, come on. Hey. Everybody clap your hands. Say, everybody clap. Everybody clap your hands. Thank you so much for tuning in today to the Mount Zion Church here in Nashville, Tennessee. This is our midweek Bible study, and I am so excited to have you connected. Let me tell you, this is going to be one of the most amazing moments of your life as we take a deep dive into those things that help us become better Christians. I want to thank you so much, and it means a lot that you've chosen to this stream today. And I'd love for you to connect with me, connect with my wife. Listen, right now, follow us on social media at Joseph Walker 3. Um, 
I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Periscope. She's out there on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Follow us. We want to connect with you. She's Dr. Steph Walker. I'm Joseph Walker III. We would love to be connected to you. I'm grateful to God also just for being able to lead the greatest reformations on the planet, the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship. And a part of that is training people who are leaders, whether you are a leader in a position or whether you are a leader in your own right. I want everybody to participate in this wonderful opportunity we have in the virtual space. It's called Propel. Some dynamic speakers are going to be uh, on this particular leadership conference, and I'm honored to preside as bishop over this fellowship. Bishop designate Craig Oliver leads this area for us, and we're grateful to God. We thank God for our founder, Bishop Morton. Look at all those amazing speakers, man. I mean, wow. You need to register for this. It's, it's, it's going to bless you. And so I want you to absolutely do it. Uh, make certain that you are registered. And uh, I believe, um, even if you uh, can just figure out a way to get there, 28th to the 30th, virtually, it will be a blessing. And I want to make sure you do that. So thank you so much in advance for registering. We definitely want to make sure that you uh, get registered, get registered, get registered, because that investment is a small investment for you to be connected to greatness, all right? We're grateful to God for you today. I want to thank you so much as you prepare to give today. I want to thank you so much as you sow to the kingdom of God. Every time we come together, we give to let God know how grateful we are. So I want you to right now get a seed in your hand. Let's do that. Um, we appreciate you so much. And uh, those of you tithe and give to this ministry, text to give right now. There's the information, keyword, and uh, you can text right now. And uh, you don't have to put a dollar sign, just put like tithes and the amount, offering and the amount to that particular uh, number and it'll, it'll prompt you. Also, those who mail in your offering, thank you so much. Mount Zion Baptist Church, Tension Finance Department, 7590 for all who can Boulevard, White's Creek, Tennessee, 37189. So we're grateful to God for you and we thank God in advance, all right? Let's pray as we get ready for the word of the Lord today. Father, thank you for this opportunity today to grow, uh, to just share. And we, as we prepare for this series today, we thank you for just helping us to be all you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So I am so excited about this series. Um, we call it the How To Series. Woo! Every believer has those how to questions. And this month, if you stay with me, we're gonna, we're gonna, it's gonna be different. I'm taking you kind of to seminary and we're gonna go deeper. You've been asking for it, here it is. Part one, how to study the Bible. Man, this is going to be fun. So I want you to stay with me. Take a lot of notes, all right? So Proverbs chapter 4, uh, verse 20 through 22, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Now, let's start with this question, and I want you to really hear this. Why should I care about going deeper in the Word of God? That's a good question, right? Here's, here is the answer. If you only study on the surface, you will only gain a surface understanding. You, you got to understand that there has to be a desire to have the fullest possible understanding of your Savior and Creator. The Bible is really a fascinating book. It, it's, it's, it's deep and it's complicated and it's, it's in some sense for so many it's confusing, but God has placed no pressure on us to know everything. You know, it, 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 it really is okay if you don't know it all, but it's the journey, the learning process. And if you knew it all, there'd be no need to study. The Bible is this book that's kind of organic. We're constantly learning and growing from it. And often we get overwhelmed, right? Because we, we, we get frustrated. We run into these areas of the Bible and like it just doesn't make sense and we throw it down, right? But we got to understand, you have to try deeper, try more often. 
And that's why we are going into this study today because we want to move beyond feeling intimidated by the big words or we feel inadequate. And quite frankly, some of us are scared to death. Sometimes we become bored. We want to get beyond that today. And I know that sounds familiar to some of you because when you look at the Word of God, you're like, oh boy, I mean, I want to study, I want to grow, but I just get so tired. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. And you open your Bible, you flip through a few pages, and then you're overwhelmed, right? And some people have asked me all the time, where do I start when I want to study the Bible? The Bible can feel intimidating, and I get that. It really can. And you want to learn the Word of God. And uh, you don't want to be anxious when you learn from it. You want it to be a natural, organic, and fun journey. So I'm going to help you understand how we can make this fun together. Now, studying the Bible can, can seem challenging. Let's just deal with that. But this lesson is designed to give you the right tools to really help you embark on this journey. So I want you to take a deep breath, the next time you prepare to read the Word of God, take a deep breath, open your Bible or your Bible app, and I want you to begin reading because the most important thing you have to do to get a clear understanding of the Scripture is you have to read it. You have to apply it to your life that you can remain consistent in your pursuit of study. Now, as Christians... And this is key. We believe that both the Old and the New Testament are divinely inspired and authoritative. Let's just process that. The Word of God is divinely inspired and authoritative. Now, people will tell you, I don't believe the Bible because man wrote it. Well, you, you believe the newspaper, man writes that. You believe magazines, man writes that. Some of you even believe the National Enquirer, for God's sake. But the difference with the Word of God is that we believe it is divinely inspired, that the Holy Spirit breathed on this Word and that it is authoritative, that it comes from God not as suggestions but as commandments in the earth. The Bible is not a book of literature, but for the reader, it, 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 it is somewhat a book of literature, but not just that. It is a book filled with faith, right? living and active. So on the one hand, there are these amazing stories and narratives, right? And, but I have to see this as a book to build my faith and the word of God is active. And advanced training is not necessary to profit from the Bible because God speaks to everyone through scripture. So you don't have to have a PhD in this. But the body of Christ has experts to help us understand the Word of God better. That's why we study. That's why you want to go deeper. Because some folks have gone to school to help us unravel the mysteries of the Scriptures. See, our salvation does not depend upon attaining a perfect knowledge of the Word of God, but it does require us to have perfect submission and a willingness to love and live according to the standards of God's Word for our lives. Because salvation is not the end of the Christian experience. It is not. It is only the beginning. And delving into the scripture helps us really see the larger plan for God for our lives. That's why it's important that Jesus says, when you baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, then teach them to observe. Because after you get saved, that's got to be the moment that you grow and you are saying, I want to learn. This, this is the discipleship piece. This is the moment where I want to be discipled to be more like Christ. I can't do it outside of learning his word. And so why do I need to study the word of God? All right? Well, as you grow in Christ, it is imperative that you learn to dig deeper into the word of God for yourself and not depend on solely the instruction of others. I mean, I'm teaching you now, but I don't want you to become so dependent upon just me that you don't study yourself. Consider Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Solid food belongs to those who are full of age. 
That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. <laughs> Milk. Milk deals with the, just the basics of the word. That's just the baby stuff. The stuff we should just know at a foundational level. The reason many of you are so hungry now because you want solid fruit. As you mature, you want to move from milk to meat. I want to get to a place where I understand how to go deeper in God's word. Well, there's only one way, and that's through an intentional study of the Bible, of the Bible. <laughs> Now, studying the Bible removes limitations because the knowledge of truth changes human character. The knowledge of truth changes human character. Now, I'm going to say some things today that's going to rattle some of you, but I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to teach you. We're going, we're going to school because I want you to get this. The Bible presents us with the history of decisions made by individuals and nations regarding the will of God. So we have this history of how Creation makes decisions, follow God's instructions, and Christians today have to learn from our wins, our mistakes, our failures, every decision. The Bible says these things were written for our examples, right? So let's understand some terminology, okay? They got a piece of paper. They got something the right way because this is where we're going to school because you, I want to take you on a deeper Understanding, right? So some seminary stuff. I'm going to drop in your spirit. All right? First of all, there is a word I want to define. It's called exegesis. All right? I want you to repeat that word with me. Exegesis. Write it down so you can spell it correctly. Exegesis. What does that word mean? Well, simply put, it is a critical explanation and interpretation of a text especially of scripture, critical inter ex explanation or interpretation. Um, it is like a critical analysis, interpretation or explanation of a written work. Exegesis is like performing an autopsy on the text. It's like peeling back the layers, right? Looking at every specific part. That, that's the real critical analysis that takes place. Early 17th century term it is. It's from the Greek word that deals with the idea to interpret or to guide. And exegesis is what comes out of the Bible as against what gets read into it. So if I'm going to be a steward of the word of God, I want to engage in this process of exegesis or exegetical work. If somebody asks you, what are you doing? I say, I'm doing some exegetical work. <laughs> of course, the ways we use uh, to find out from the Bible uh, what the Bible is saying, you know, sometimes we can find out some things that are happening between the lines, right? <clears throat> the Word of God is silent on some things, and we have to understand some broader issues of context and culture. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but in a more theological setting, exegesis means what comes from the use of certain methods of studying the Bible. Like, what, what did I get from all of this deep dive into the scripture? Just about every imaginable method already has a name. And there are all sorts of mixes. But the main types are these. Listen, first is historical. Okay? Using the historical context to find what it meant back when it was written or when it happened. Let's process that. Historical. So when I read a scripture in 2020 and I'm applying it to my life, I have to realize something. There is a historical framework by which this has occurred. I'll give you a perfect example. The book of Acts is written by Luke because Luke writes Luke and Acts. It's actually seen as one whole book. But what's interesting about that is that many people interpret you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Acts 1.8, and, and we go to the upper room and wait. So the book of Acts is interpreted somewhat like a theological book, 
when in fact it's a book of history. It, it, it is a book. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm saying we are getting a historical framework of how the Holy Spirit came into the earth, how the disciples became apostles. We are seeing the movement of the church historically. So when that was spoken, go to the upper room and wait, it was not meant for us to take it as a theological, practical term, but a historical analysis to help us know what had occurred because the Holy Spirit had not yet come. So there are people who develop a theology and apply it to a denominational reality or construct saying, you got to sit here and tarry and wait for the Holy Ghost after you've been saved. When in fact, the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 from a historical perspective and he now lives inside of everyone who experiences salvation. So why do I have to wait for something that's already come? Because I didn't pay attention to the historical perspective. Does that make sense? Then there is the canonical understanding. And that word is a big word, I know. Look at it in, 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 in the root word, canon. The Bible is canonized, meaning it has, it has been put together uh, and, and it's divinely inspired books. And so the 66 books serve as what's called the canon. And the canon was seen as closed. No other books can interpret that. And there's some controversy about that in terms of what we, what we discover in, in, you know, in, in a lot of the you know, other extra biblical material like Maccabees and all those, all those particular works. And we'll talk about that at a later time. But treating the Bible as a whole document designed to be a specific community shapes by which it, the community shaped its life by. So I see the Bible as a continuum, like from creation all the way through Revelations to the end of days and the resurrection from the dead when we are in glory with God. And it shapes a whole community. I see the word of God from a canonical perspective. This happened so that could happen. The apostles or the prophets came and so that Jesus could come, so that the apostle Paul could preach, so that we could ultimately go into this idea of being with Christ as Paul talks about it in the New Testament. Then there's a symbolic and allegorical, right? Which is, which is interesting because now this is how you figure out each story and character and what event represents. So when I look at the word of God, there's all this symbolism, and allegory. You got to understand that, right? Because when you start reading the Song of Solomon, the Bible's giving all this sexual language about her breast or, you know, her kisses were sweet. What is that referring to? Is that, what is that symbolism referring to? What is the allegorical meaning of a lot of the things that we're, we're seeing there? We have to look at that. And what are the character like Gomer and Hosea and all those things represent, right? Uh, Gomer and Hosea and Israel being the, you know, unfaithful wife. And all those different things. And you go deeper, you find out much more. What, what is the literary understanding? Well, the literary understanding, using the literal forms, right? Literary forms is another way of understanding this. So let's look at this. The literary is using forms, um, looking at the work in terms of editing, the main themes, the narratives, and understanding what is written. So when I examine the literary framework, I'm, I'm looking at something a little different. Then there is the rational, <laughs> rational understanding, where <coughs> I am thinking it through using logic and deductive techniques, all right? So logic and deductive techniques, what, thinking through it using logic. This had to have happened because of this. This had to have happened historically because of this, the storm that Jesus and the disciples were in. I have to know historically on the Sea of Galilee, what occurred during that time and why was it a treacherous journey when, when the Apostle Paul was in a storm? What was going on during the history of that time and how storms were treacherous in winter and how they probably knew that it was going to be a treacherous trip and was it rational for them to go? Th those kinds of things, right? 
Let's look at this word eisegesis, all right? We just learned the word exegesis. Let's look at eisegesis. I hope this is helping you. Now, this is the interpretation of the Bible about reading stuff into it, reading your own ideas. The last thing you want to be is an eisegetical, you know, study of the Word of God because th this is when people put their own stuff in the preconceived notions. This is how the Bible got messed up. People took their own issues and convoluted the integrity of the Word of God, right? We made the Bible say what we want the Bible to say. That's why we can look over history and the Bible justifies slavery or justifies, you know, sexism and all these other isms because we put stuff in the Bible that never was intended to be, right? Um, and theologians frown on this because this is not rooted in Scripture. It, 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 and, and, and this is how we twist the Word of God. You see it happening in the political arena. You see it happening in different cultures, different denominations. We twist the word of God and we can make the word of God justify or condemn whatever we wanted to do. That's eisegesis. That's when you see what the scripture's saying, but say, you know, I think God meant this. Like, I think God meant this. Really? Really? <laughs> see? So you may hear some, someone, you know, take a Bible verse out of context and then interpret it using their own biased perspective and justify implementing a policy of personal belief. Right, think about that, for example. How many times have you seen a policy based on the scripture? <laughs> or you, you've seen, you know, a personal belief, somebody holding strong to a strong conviction, and you're like, but that's not what the Bible really meant. I mean, there's so many examples I can give you around that. But that's what we end up doing, right? I, I, I humorously talk all the time about when Paul says, have women have your heads covered and how people took that and they start putting those little nets on their head like that's what it meant. We start doing all these other things that ceremoniously had nothing to do with what the scripture was actually saying, right? The right method becomes, you know, um, important because the scriptures are God-breathed, man. The, the, the word of God is so... It's so important. It cannot handle this lightly. That's why I don't play with God's word. You, you not only run the risk of, of harboring false beliefs if you don't do the exegetical work properly, but you can lead other people astray. That's why you just can't open the word of God and be like, now see, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible, look right here at this scripture. This is what the Bible says. But you haven't taken anything into historical context. You haven't done the exegetical work. You haven't gone deeper. And so that's why you got to have a teacher that can help you understand that. People tell you, well, I don't need a teacher. I can do my, you do need a teacher. How shall they hear without the preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Y'all, I'm a Bible teacher, man. I'm telling you, I love to teach you the Word of God. I'm going to help you learn how to study it yourself. That's why this word hermeneutic is important. I want you to say that word, hermeneutic. Everybody say it together. Hermeneutic. Write it down. Take your time. Spell it properly. It's a big word. It's because hermeneutics is primarily concerned with how you interpret a passage. If you choose to do one process versus another, what is your hermeneutic, right? Watch this. The purpose of hermeneutics is to bridge the gap between our minds and the mind of the biblical writer. Like, what was the biblical writer actually saying? Giving me a thorough understanding of, of the knowledge of the original languages, the ancient history, the comparison of scripture with scriptures, right? Looking at what contextually might have been meant when the writer wrote this thing in that context. <coughs> Through hermeneutics, Biblical interpretation can be achieved in three ways. Historical, the message, and doctrine. Let's talk about it. Because using, you know, theologians, usually what we do is that we pair hermeneutics with exegesis because you can't have one without the other. You really can't. You can't do that kind of deep dive and not come back with an interpretation. So what do we gain? What do we gain from studying the Bible, all right? Well, one, we gain the power of accurate observation. <clears throat> what, what do we notice? What do I see here? What do I see going on, right? And that's critical, right? That is so critical. You know, you think about Sherlock Holmes, right? Remember that? He would look at all the minute details of every particular mystery, every particular person's life. That's what made Sherlock Holmes different because he was such a great 
investigator because he had insight into things that other folk took for granted. When you study the Word of God, you got to look at all the little intricate details and look at things that other folk would overlook and begin to say, wow, I never paid attention to that until now. That's how you study the Word of God because that's the power of observation and studying Scripture. Clearly, everybody knows what the Scripture may be saying, but there's other little things in there that you may miss, right? How many times have you heard folks say, you know, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, right? Oh, you know all things work together for good, right? And you look at that like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. But then you take a deeper look at that. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So if a person is, doesn't have a relationship with God and are not walking on their purpose, how can it work together for their good? See, let me help you understand something. We often read through passages of Scripture without absorbing a lot of what it's saying. You got to carefully read this, man. You got to look for the details. And I know some of you are like, oh my God, that just takes so much time. But see, the more informed you are, right, the more accurate your interpretation will be at the end. I wish you knew how long it took just, you know, us to get the word together and prepare. We don't play with this scripture. Man. We don't play with these sermons. This stuff is deep out here, man. And when you observe, it's a learned skill. The more you practice seeing the details in God's word, the better off you're going to be. And it'd be easier to see it further up the road, right? Because you got to take your time. You can't run through it. You take one scripture, you look at it, context, you look at the history, you're like, man, I want to take each one of these words. I want to dissect it. What, what was the writer actually saying? And over time, you're going to realize the tiniest details can often be, bring enormous revelation to the passage. The tiniest little details can bring immeasurable revelation on what was actually occurring. And sometimes people miss those, miss those details and you miss revelation. Then that's interpretation, which means, and let's deal with that. It means, you know, making sense of the text. You know, it's not a special skill reserved for difficult passages only. The Holy Spirit does not provide, you know, uh, ambiguous interpretation of every given text, every single time you read the Bible, you must interpret what you read. And the way to go about that is make a sense of the Bible and understanding, okay, wait a minute, there's got to be some cultural realities here. There's got to be some, some, some cross-references of things I can do to understand what's really being said because our frame of reference and cultural expectations can sometimes hinder us from understanding the intent of what the author really meant. Sometimes our own issues, where we are in our own lives, we can take our cultural, you know, uh, slants and, our, and where we are, and we can apply that to the Word of God, like, well, the Bible had to mean this because, you know, this is what's going on. But no, not necessarily, right? Keep in mind the origin of the Bible and the overall purpose of Scripture can help orient our expectations as we read. And there's application. The Bible instructs every person to consider his or her personal, you know, way of life. Ephesians 5 and 15 says, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So when you read the Word of God, it's trying to help you, like, understand the truth about your own life. How does it affect your relationship with God? So now I start looking at this and saying, okay, well then God, what are you saying to me? Not only what are you saying, but what are you saying to me and how can this help me mature and grow as a believer? You know, this is what's important. How, how does this word apply to my life? How do, how do I see myself in the image of Jesus Christ? I want to give you seven routine steps for biblical study and then we're going to be done. I want you to write these down. This is a disclaimer now. I want to give a disclaimer first because you know, it's not the only way to study the Bible. There's a ton of them out there. This is just what I want to share with you, all right? Just one model, but I hope it blesses. Start with prayer. So when you read the Word of God, start with prayer. Open up your Bible and then say, okay, God, show me what you want me to see. Show me, God, you know, help me understand what you want to say to me in this moment. Prepare, open up my heart. Talk to me about the things that you need me to learn right through here. Now, people ask me all the time, what's a good place to start reading the Bible? I tell them Proverbs. That's a great 
place to start. Man, I promise you. Then read through, number two, and read through it again. <clears throat> Don't just read the scripture one time. Read it over again. You may see something different. You may see something different. Read it once and then read it again, right? You're able to take in notes, right? Highlighting. Read the passage first. Don't do anything. And then read it again. So before you start moving and out, just read it. Read it again, right? Look to see what it's saying before you start trying to dissect it deeper. It's on the surface level, let's just read it and read it, read it, right? Then start taking mental notes. Start highlighting things. Start looking at different words and say, okay, let me sit, remember this point. Let me remember this word. This word stood out. Always remember, repetition matters. So when you see a word spoken more than one time throughout a particular context of scripture, pay attention to that because that means that God is really trying to get something to you, all right? So write down your questions, do all that. And then number three, think about a title or how to summarize the particular scripture you're reading for yourself. You can say, all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, when I look at this scripture, this scripture is talking about love in 1 Corinthians 13. So, you know, maybe I'll just call this love for me or how to love or whatever. There's no right or wrong there, but it's something to help you understand as you memorize scripture and, and grow in scripture that it helps you understand where, where you can find, you know, scriptures concerning those areas of your life. Now, you know, what's sadly, mediocrity is a hallmark of our age. And a lot of people, you know, these high goals of spiritual growth, what I'm talking about, all these different things, people say, I don't have time for that. That's why they never grow in God's word. Man, let me tell you something. You got to get to a point, Philippians uh, 3 and 8 says, yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Woo! That's powerful. Philippians 3 and 8, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, Paul says, I count them as rubbish that I may obtain or gain Christ. Paul is saying, look, man, I, when I think about my relationship with Jesus Christ, I, everything is lost. I'm after it. So let's aim high. Let's go high in God's word. Number four, look into Bible study tools. That's some great, get you a good, get you a good Bible that has a, you know, some of y'all got to get a paper Bible. <laughs> you know, get a good Bible that has a, a good, you know, um, commentary tied to it. Get a good translation, you know, Logos Bible Software as a partnership we have with Logos. I'll be sharing with you how you can download that soon. You get that, it'll bless you. It's a lot of good stuff out there, a lot of good tools that you can get to study the Bible, to help you understand stuff, do the deep diving for you. And this is why it's important, right? And uh, that's why we turn to exper experts and scholars and translators who've, who've already done all this work for us and they can help us understand certain words, right? Um, and plays on words, right? The Bible has a lot of play on words, right? Use the concordance, a commentary, right? You hear Jesus saying, upon this rock I'll build my church. That word rock is Petros, and that word Petros means hard place, solid place, and that can take you down a whole nother path in understanding Peter, <laughs> right? And uh, so let's look at number five. Pay attention to the historical context. Context is key. You don't understand the context, you just got a pretext. Take the Bible seriously. Everything has historical context, man. Let me get an example. For those of you that say, well, why can't we just take the scripture off the page and just apply it to right now? Well, you have to understand scripture comes out of context. Let me tell you something. I saw, I saw something recently and read something I thought was very interesting, right? You take like the Constitution of the United States was written in the 17th century. And people often say, what did the framers intend? <laughs> that, that's a great question. And the Constitution is what we govern our country by, our great Constitution, right? When you think about a lot of the issues that are happening in culture today, just think, process for a moment. How we establish laws concerning policing and other things are tied to the Constitution. Right? How we, you know, go into somebody's house. <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. So, if you process that for a moment, there were no police 
departments when the Constitution was written. So if there were no the police departments when the Constitution was written, watch this then, then what was in play? Well, African Americans were not even seen as human beings when the Constitution was written. So then you are applying the way in which they responded to certain things in the 17th century to 2020 when everything has changed. So if I don't have a historical understanding, I might actually miss a very needed interpretation of what that means to me right now. Same thing in the scripture. How women were viewed in a patriarchal society, well, male-dominated society. Women had to sit on one side, men sat on the other side. So I see scripture say, women be silent in the church. And that use that scripture to say, women should not preach. I don't have any historical understanding. I got to go back and say, back in history, during that time, how were women being treated? Because just because, you know, we have the word of God, it doesn't mean that it did not come out of historical framework or reality. Does that make sense? You got to take time to go and study that, man. Understand what was happening in history back then and then sift through that and work through it. What does it mean right now? All right? All right, watch this. So you got to keep these questions in mind. What was going on when it was written? Who was it written to? When was it written? And where was it written? You know, was it written in Rome? Was it written here? I mean, what, what was it written? That's how I gain a deeper understanding of the social, political, economic, climate, the passage was written in. That helps me understand why Paul and Silas were put in a jail cell. What was the economic climate? Why were, you know, the people in the marketplace, you know, you know no longer sympathizers with Paul and Silas because they were losing money because anytime, you know, you're being accused of, you know, teaching customs which are not lawful for those to receive, right? and you take money out of people who are exploiting a girl, the people in the marketplace say, well, you're, you're messing with our money too. That's how you end up in that situation. So it's a lot in scripture, man, that we have to go deeper and gain a deeper understanding, right? Understanding what the author was saying, who was the author, and all those things. And that's important, right? And I think when you look at number six, consider the cultural context and significance. What's the cultural context? Think about the story of the prodigal son, all right? The story that serves as, a, as an example in Luke 15, right? When you, know the, when you know the cultural context, you realize that when the father goes, the son goes to the father and he asks the father for his inheritance first, how incredibly disrespectful that was in a culture like that. You'll learn a lot from that story, right? Because New Testament scholars teach us that the Jewish son not only acted disgracefully by asking for the inheritance, but, you know, but he further debased himself by squandering it. And, and, and the son's behavior warranted what was called a, 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 a kezaza, right? And this is important because it's a cutting off ceremony. There was this moment where the Jewish people believed you've got to have a ceremony that cut you off. <laughs> Imagine that. And that helps you understand that when the father sees his son coming back and the other son is upset because he hadn't been cut off, it helps you understand some things, right? And it also helps you understand that during that time, you know, fathers during that time and Jewish fathers during that time, they walked very slow and dignified. That's the way they walked. And so when you see the father running to his son, you know, it, it's breaking all kind of, you know, uh, uh, Middle Eastern culture in terms of being dignified. And he runs and falls on his son, showing us that he breaks protocol uh, to love his son. It, it's so much in that, right? And I think that's important. And Jesus tells this story to a Middle Eastern audience. And, and they would have understood the father's love in a deeper way than we would have. Now that you read it, you're like, wow. It's a lot in that, how they viewed pigs and the son having to, you know, find a job in the pig pen. Jews never inter intertwined with swine. All that stuff is in the scripture, but you got to go deeper to understand it. And then number seven, what is the meaning for today? How does it apply to my life, y'all? This is the end game right here, guys. This is it. How does it apply to my life? What does it have to do to me? See, I I I'm teaching this because I want you to understand 
as we study the word together and we grow, Paul says in, 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 in 1 Timothy 1, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Paul says, I'm an apostle. Paul says, I, I want to, I'm a teacher, I'm a vessel. And, and, and I want you to understand what I do. My responsibility is I'm a teacher to help you, watch this, <laughs> to help you come to a place where you get excited about growing in God's word. His word is a fascinating book. And I don't want a church that's biblically literate. I want people that are hungry and excited about growing together. Y'all, we can do this. They're going to continue to grow deeper. And in this how-to series, I'm going to continue to stretch you. And I hope it generates an excitement about God's word. One thing I do know is that the word that God gives me and I prepare for you each week is a word that I know comes straight from heaven. And that word is designed to help you grow and to be all that God has called you to be. Jeremiah 3, 15 says that God will give you pastors after my own heart who will teach you, who will teach you, who will teach you. Not shout you, but will teach you. All of what we've been going through in this season, this is a time maybe for us to spend more time in God's word. Get you a Bible, open that thing up, Start searching. Take advantage of what this ministry makes available for you. Discipleship Institute, all the classes we're going to be bringing forth. I'm going to be doing some deeper dive Bible studies and letting you study the Word of God with me soon. But I want this to stimulate in you a desire for more. I hope you've been blessed. I've been blessed sharing it with you. Oof, it's been a blessing sharing this one. And I want to thank you. And if you're here watching me and you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's where it starts because the relationship with him is a relationship with his word. And he loves you so much. And if you desire that or want to be a part of our ministry and you're like, I want to grow. This is where I want to be. I want to grow like this. I want to learn more. Then I want you to email me at salvation at mtzionnashville.org. Do it right now. I guarantee you, it'll bless your life. I thank you. I want to hear from you. And I pray God's blessings be upon you. Thank you again for sowing into this ministry. I thank you for giving and thank you for the text to give information. I appreciate you for just sharing and we love you. And I hope that you'll stay with this series because this is the how-to. And I got one for you next week. And I guarantee you, will oh, bless your life. May God bless you, is my prayer. God bless. I hope you were blessed by today's Bible study. You know, we're very excited to bring this word into your life, particularly in this season where all of us are social distancing and attempting to uh, abide by what the CDC is asking us to do. But the word of God is so important in all of our lives. And what I want you to do is I want you to let me know if this message has blessed you. Stay connected with me at Joseph Walker 3 on Instagram, my wife, Dr. Steph Walker. We love to connect with you. And also, you have an opportunity right now to give haven't done that, please sow into what God is blessing you with. We want to be able to continue to reach more souls for Jesus Christ. You help us do that. Right here is the text to give information. Thank you so much for watching it, and we can't wait to share another word with you.